So the book quickly became kind of a source of, uh, of um, I was talking a little bit about how the book became a source of um, uh, dissent or a, a source of, uh, you know, counter or insurgency, I suppose might be a modern word for, you know, kind of this, this anti-crown sentiment. And so in 1765, the, the, there was a passing of the Stamp Act, which basically required that um, in order to pay for the French Indian War, uh, that the, you know, that the, they were going to charge, you'd have to, if you were to publish a book, you'd have to put stamps on it. Um, just like stamps, you know, stamps are like for mail, but stamps also come on like alcohol. There's usually a stamp somewhere on it. Cigarettes, there's a stamp at the bottom. If you buy, if you ever smoked or know somebody that smokes, there is a stamp at the bottom. They have to put this stamp on it. If you buy a house, you technically have to buy stamps. I don't know if they actually use any stamps, but that is a process. Um, and so that was back in the day. In order to sell a book, you'd have to have stamps on it that proved you'd paid the tax. Um, and that passed in March 1765, and it was going to double the cost of publication. Mainly the reason was is it was going to be um, the idea that um, – that basically there was going to be a way to slow down, you know, kind of books from being published, kind of try to squelch that industry, as well as give some control to the government of being able to go in and if somebody published something that wasn't stamped that they could then, uh, you know, run counter. Well, the governors from the crown or from the royal, you know, royalty, uh, the royal governors, you know, those who were sent by England to, to rule the, the colonies, um, they never bothered to enforce it. And so there were some lawsuits, there were some efforts to clamp down the Zanger acquittal, which, uh, things like that. And so there was some of the early uh, work. And some of the early books, one of the first big books to sell, the first really huge bestseller as far as a book goes, uh, was a book called Common Sense by Thomas Paine. It was 47 pages. And in three months, it sold 120,000 copies. Now, that may not sound like a lot. I told I was talking about the population. I did look at the time it was published. The population was four hundred thousand. This would have been around the time of the Revolution, seventeen seventies, um, and so. And then he wrote um, several pamphlets called the American Crisis. Also, were very common, popular. And so, I mean, out of one hundred twenty thousand copies out of a population of four hundred thousand, is pretty much everybody bought a copy. I mean, you can't argue that, especially because. You know, I mean, I wouldn't say everybody bought a copy, but everybody bought it, and it was uh, definitely big. As far as the early um, uh, industry, most of the printing presses ended up going kind of to like the, uh, you know, like you'd have small towns, and the small towns would have like kind of a postmaster who would also be the general store. Um, you know, maybe you've gone and like learned stuff about Lincoln and gone to say, you know, kind of have that, you know, general store, postmaster, everything all in one spot kind of uh uh, place and you know basically it would be they would also be like a newspaper office and they would also be a book printer things like that and that's where kind of printing in that industry these were kind of highly connected very localized they knew everything that was going on and they were that part of society and so this was kind of a place where the book became very much a, a point and became very much centered on the fact that a book can be a tool of uh, of gathering counter ideas, ideas that are counter to the greater culture. And that's an idea that still persists within literacy or within books is that the book is a form of sort of counter, uh, a, a counter viewpoint or a insurgent viewing idea. Um, not sure I like any of those words I'm using for against the popular culture. Um, anyway, in 18... You know, so we go like for the next hundred years, books um, were very expensive. They could cost up to uh, weeks worth of pay. So, I mean, you have to think like a book may have been a couple bucks, but a, but a couple bucks would have been what you got paid for a week. So this would be like several hundred dollars in today's day and age. Um, and so, you know, a working class person wouldn't be able to buy books very often. Maybe they'd save and maybe once a year, twice a year, maybe be able to buy a book. And that's why that Christmas thing becomes important. But the United States was kind of in a unique position. Um, in 1861, the United States had the highest literacy rate of any country in the world. It was 58%, meaning you know three out of five people could read. That was due to the fact we had compulsory education, and you know it was highly prized. Um, and so you know. Uh, maybe the religious thing, people want to be able to read the Bible. There was a lot of Protestants that, you know, that was important. You know, the Lutheran idea of like sola scriptura, 
um, that you know that you alone can interpret the scripture, and that the scripture is uh, is you know the only source of authority, and we can't rely upon other people to intercede on that. And so you know, versus the Catholic tradition, which has more of an idea of uh, the the priest as a mediator between the the scripture and God and court and history and uh, the people, who allows for the understanding. Um, I won't get into anything on that because I could do a whole hour lecture on those concepts and how each one has a great value. Um, anyway, but the uh, anyway, so by 40 years later, by the early 1900s, the literacy rate in the United States was 90 percent. So it's nearly universal. This was the only um, country in which that was really the case. In the 1800s, the also we began to have the novel. People began to buy books more. Um, and the, one of the things that happened was um, they also came about the invention of the linotype machine. See, the way a book would have been printed originally was maybe you'd make a cast of the whole page. Well, then they came along and you could put movable text in, right? Little letters, each letter. So, like, you want to write the word dog, you'd put a metal D in, a metal O, and a metal G. And then you push that together, tighten in a screw, and that would lock this line of text in place. And you'd go down the whole row, right? And... Back in the day, even like newspapers or anything, people would physically, I mean, people would get good at it and they would do this kind of stuff, right? And they would do this quickly. And if you were, and you know, maybe some of you, um, if you've ever been to flea markets, maybe some of you do crafty stuff like that. Sometimes they have these things, they're called uh, printer's drawers, and they were just drawers with lots of little holes. Now people will buy these printer's drawers, and they're big drawers. They're usually only about an inch deep, and they're about like three feet wide and about 18 inches deep. And they have all kinds, every letter has a little AB square, like two by two or one and a half by one and a half. And they're just letters, a capital and lowercase, commas, periods, things like that. And a printer would just sit there and, you know, grab them from the drawers and, you know, pull them out of those little holes. And they'd pull out the next drawer in this big chest of them when they ran out. And then when they got done, they'd have to sort them all back into the drawer. And that was, that was what they did. Well, around the 1800s, they created this thing called a linotype machine. Now, a linotype machine was nice because what a linotype machine did was instead of having to physically do it, it had a keyboard, like a typewriter. And you know how like typewriters, old school manual typewriters, they have like when you push the button, a a, um, a, uh, a little bar like with the A is connected to it and it comes up a little stick and it hits the A against an ink pad and it puts the letter on. I don't know if any of you have seen those or have them, uh, but you know, that's an old school typewriter. Well, the linotype machine worked in the same way. It had a keyboard, but when you pushed it, it would throw up the letter, like the letter A, if you need a lowercase a, it would throw it into the spot, and then it would, you know, and so the person could actually type out the page, right? And so a, a line of text could be set very quickly, screw tightened in, and it was very quick. Now, this type of writing, this, this form, actually continued up until like the 1960s and 70s. I mean, even newspapers, that's the way they would have done it. And at the end of the day, when they got done, they printed the paper. They would loosen the screw, they'd dump them all out, and somebody would sort everything back into the line of type machine, and they would start over again the next day. And then eventually they got to where they could physically print it, and they could do paste and ink and, and other things. But that line of type machine made what even before was a quicker process, an even faster process, which brought the price of, um, uh, of printing down. And then they, uh, they began to use like photographic plates called lithography, versus heavy metal plates. And so there were a bunch of different inventions that came about that allowed for the book to become very popular. And by 1850, uh, you had, you know, a lot of novels. Scarlet Letter was published, Moby Dick, 1851, Scarlet Letter in 1884. Um, and these were all American novels that were selling very well here. Then you had, like, in Europe, you had the Bronte sisters, you know, Austin, Jane Austen, things like that. And so, you know, the United States, because because their literacy, because their printing, uh, became a quick uh, actor in the world of publishing of books. So the next big development was the uh, in in 1860, about around the same time, uh, the you know books were um, you know literacy was 58 percent, but the book was also um, fairly expensive. Along came what's called a dime novel, and basically. Um, it was it was a book that was going to be ten cents, and these were books that were written mainly kind of popular culture. They were uh, frontier adventure stories. Usually, they were they were about you know kind of people out you know uh, cowboys and Native Americans, cowboys and Indians is the uh, you know that kind of story um, out you know settling the West, and these became very popular. 
um, and they were only 10 cents because they used a cheap paper um, that was, uh, they also were called pulp fiction because instead of using like nice paper, they were using pulpy paper like a newspaper and they would then put it together and glue it and they would put like a paper cover over it instead of a hard cover. These things were not very durable. They would, you know, get destroyed quicker, but you, for 10 cents, you could buy it. And 10 cents, while still would have been probably like 20 bucks or something, would have been a lot more expensive than a, than a modern day paperback. It would have been something that somebody could have bought, you know, they could have bought one of these every week or two if they wanted to put aside the money, if they thought reading was really important. And so that was something that made that a possibility. Um, the, the dime novel uh, was also, and they would, they started marketing as, you know, why pay a dollar for a book that's a dime, that for, you know, a dollar book for a dime. And so, um, the pulp novels, um, was another name for it. And, but mainly these were books that were not the higher caliber. These were kind of books written for that medium. They were books meant for that disposable, less literate, you know, less, less, they were kind of more adventure books. They weren't expected to sell. But they sold 4 million copies in five years because of the technology that helped bring it about. Uh, one company sold 4 million in five years from 1860, 1865. Beetle and Company did that. Um, during, they, they were the early paperbacks, but what happened was um, that, that the, uh, the paperback um, became a... Sorry, I was just looking. Sorry, the paperback um, was mainly these were books that were sold for that. But then the invention of like the paperback during the Great Depression, um, there was kind of Penguin Books came about, and they started doing selling what were called paperbacks. And paperbacks at that point became uh, second runs of the successful hardcover. So the first pulp books were really books designed purely for the paperback market. The second ones, the the the, the paperbacks that came about in the Great Depression, was kind of what we modern day. You know, the paperbacks of the pulp era would be like romance novels, adventure novels, things that are printed paperback from the beginning. Nobody ever bothers to print hardback, you know, harlequin romance novels. They're always paperback. They're, they're less expensive. That's the only way you can back covers of those. But the, um, but the, the, the hardback was kind of more your higher end, your books that were not necessarily kind of that genre. They were a little bit higher level novel. Well, the, during the Great Depression, Penguin Books came along and they said, why don't we take some of these and put them into that paperback format and they would sell those for a quarter instead of several dollars. People thought it was going to cheapen the book, but it also made the book possible to be purchased during that era and became very popular. By today's day and age, 60% of all books sold are paperback because the cheaper end, the ones that people consume in mass quantities, they don't want to pay 30 bucks. They want to pay six, seven bucks. And so, uh, you know, that was, of the printed books, paperback is a very cheap option. And for people who don't necessarily want the book the first week it's out, they don't want to spend 30 bucks, they want to spend 15 or 20, that paperback became an economic factor that helped that book to, to, uh, to, to become very popular. So after this video, I'm going to talk next about some of the issues in books in the modern age, go through the different categories, and talk about, like, convergence and electronic books and print-on-demand a literacy, uh, how publishers are built, things like that. And that's about it.